Welcome back to Sabbath Services. We'll continue on here. Now, here's a question. Could you please give a sermon on tithing? Well, yes, I could. We have a whole series on it with a booklet that goes with it that covers about tithing and giving and so forth. Okay? So... We'll save that for a later time. In the meantime, write in for all the information on tithing. Now, here's a question. What is the reason do you think that Daniel is not mentioned in the 144,000? Well, let's go back and look at it. When was Daniel the prophet? Well, during the 600s B.C., He will be raised when the prophets are raised. The 144,000, and with that, the 144,000 is not until two full years into the last three and a half years. And it's talking about the tribes of Israel And it's not talking about individual persons like Daniel. Also, you noted correctly that Ephraim is not mentioned directly, but yes, he is, because Ephraim then was the son of Joseph, and it mentions Joseph as you come down here, Daniel, the seventh chapter. Okay? Tribe of Joseph, verse 8. Okay? That includes Ephraim. So what do we have? We have all three of the sons of Rachel. Okay? And that is Manasseh and Joseph and Benjamin. Now, what also does this show? For those people who say the 12 tribes or the 10 tribes of Israel have been absorbed into all the Gentiles, well, if they've been absorbed into the Gentiles, they don't exist. But in Amos 9 and verse 9, it says that God would filter them through many nations and not lose a seed. Okay? Now, this also proves that all 12 tribes exist in the end time. Because these are physical people from the physical tribes. Okay. Now Daniel and the other prophets are not mentioned. And Dan, it says in Genesis 49 that Dan will await his salvation. So he's not mentioned there because Dan is involved in too much idolatry. Let's pick it up here. Here's one man says, beginning to sound more like Herbert Armstrong. Okay. Well, I don't know if that's a compliment or (laughs) whatever it may be. I don't try and follow him. I follow Christ. However, he followed Christ. That's good. When he didn't, it led to trouble. When I don't, it leads to trouble. When you don't, it leads to trouble, right? If any of the mainstream church leaders and politicians understood the Sabbath or understood other parts of God's plan but refused to teach it, then they would have to answer to God. And it's highly unlikely that any of them would be listening to your messages. Well, that's true. But there are other people who listen to them that need to hear it, that will respond to what I have said. These men deliberately, knowingly, with malice, reject the Sabbath and the holy days. So I won't back off on talking about them. I don't care if they hear me or not. Okay, here we go. About the Pope. This is from uh, 
Albert and Renetta Miller in Deutschland. Okay, the Pope is supposed to go go to Kiev and Moscow. The Pope has never gone to Moscow. Wonder what that will turn out to be if he if he goes. May not be able to go. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Here's one. Reuben had four sons. Which one was the father of Joel, of whom Gog line came down from? Uh, I don't know. And the genealogies in this particular case are not necessarily relevant to any prophecy. Matthew 28, 19. Okay, let's go there. Verse 19. Therefore, Jesus said, Go and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And people get all excited about it who believe in a trinity that this says it's a trinity. No, it's not. Now, other people believe we should only baptize in the name of Jesus. Okay? That's not true either. Others say that the Catholics put this in the Bible. No, they didn't put it in the Bible. If anyone put it in the Bible, it had to be the Apostle John when they were canonizing the New Testament just before he died. And John is the one who wrote more about the Holy Spirit than anyone else. And every place in the Gospel of John, speaking of the Holy Spirit, It is in the neuter gender. It is not a person. And if this verse were added, which it very well may have been, it was probably John who did so. Because he was the one to canonize the final canonization of the New Testament. Okay? So let's read it. Into the name of the Father. Why? Because we're going to be a son or daughter of God. All right? And of the Son, because we have our sins forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his shed blood. But notice it doesn't say, and name of. It just says, and of the Son. And then it says, and of the Holy Spirit. It does not say, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? Now, why would this be here? Because the purpose of repenting and being baptized is to what? Receive the Holy Spirit, correct? Okay. And that's the important thing of baptism. So this is why it's here. It's not for a trinity. It is to round out everything necessary for baptism, okay? So I hope that helps you there. Here's another one. Let's come to Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation, the first chapter. Now this is talking about the seven spirits of God. Okay? So the question is, what are they, what do they do, and why are they addressed here? And are they addressed anyplace else in the Bible? Well, we'll see. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace be to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Okay. Now we see that mentioned again here in chapter 3 and verse 1. The angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now the seven stars represent the seven churches. What do the seven spirits represent? All right? 
Let's come to chapter 4. We'll see they're mentioned there. Revelation 4 and verse 5. And proceeding from the throne were lightnings and thunders and voices and seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God burning before the throne. Okay. Now, come to chapter 5. We have it explained. Verse 6. Then I saw and behold, and before the throne and the four living creatures and before the elders was standing a lamb as having been slain, having seven horns. Okay. That means each one of those horns represent a church. And it since the horns are in the head of the lamb, that shows that Jesus is the head of the churches of God. That's important to understand. Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that are sent into all the earth. Now, what do they do? Okay. How do they function? Well, they assist God. Let's come back here to Second Chronicles now. Second Chronicles 16. And we will see. They assist God in helping to find those who are seeking him. Because how is it that out of all the billions of people on the earth and a man way out, middle of nowhere, or maybe in the middle of a huge city, he starts seeking God. How is God going to know? Well, the seven spirits help him. Okay. Let's come to chapter 15 first, and then we'll come to chapter 16. Chapter 15. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went to meet Asa. Now, Asa is the king. And said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. Never forget that. See? And if you seek him, you will be found by him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Well, now, Asa did good for a while. And then he left God. Okay. Then the warning came because he came to offer at the temple. Okay. Chapter 16. Let's pick it up in verse 7. Okay. And at that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped out of your hand. So then he gives him a lesson. Now, if you're going to trust God, you got to trust him. So here, Ananias said to him, Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand so he could win the battle. Now notice verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord, that's those seven spirits which are the eyes of God, run to and fro in the whole earth. So they're busy. Okay? Anyone seeking God? Boom! God knows they're seeking. If they're praying for help, and it's a prayer that God is going to answer, he will answer it to encourage them to continue to seek him. Okay? Now notice, 
The eyes of the Lord run true and fro in all the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. And then Asa was angry and threw the prophet in prison. So much for thanking God, see? Everything that we do with God must be based on the word of God. Now today, we have the spirit of God in us. Direct connection to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Direct connection to the throne in heaven above and all that is done. Okay? And God will hear our prayers. Okay? This one has to do with regarding tattoos. Leviticus 19.28 says, let's go read that. Okay. Leviticus 19.28. And that is true. And tattoos are something that a lot of people do today. You see so many athletes that have tattoos all over them. Now what about it? So the person says, well... What do we do about them? Shall we have them removed? Well, I don't know if you can remove remove them or not. But here's what it says, verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. Okay? That's what the cuttings were for. Nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. So what... What do you do? Well, I would hope that if you could get them removed, that would be possible. But some people are so covered with tattoos, it's almost like they need a whole new set of human flesh for their whole body. I don't know what to do in cases like that, but I don't know anyone who's been called to that has that many tattoos. Okay? So... I think this, you ask if there's any reason for any tattoos at all, and I don't think there's any reason for it. Okay? So it's a difficult thing. And a lot of people have them today. So I suggest, go see what you can do about them. Okay, here's one. Okay. Hebrews 3. 18 and 19. Is this referring to Sabbath keeping or God's kingdom? Hebrews 3, read verse 15 and go forward from there. Okay. As it is being said, now this is a quote from Psalm 95, which is a Sabbath quote. Okay. And what was the first major sin of Israel in the wilderness. Breaking the Sabbath and making idols when Moses was up on the mountain getting the instruction from God. Okay? So it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in a rebellion. And they kept rebelling against God and rebelling against God. Read all the book of Numbers and see how many difficult and trying times that Moses had to go through because the children of Israel didn't believe God. See, they had a very difficult time getting Egypt out of their system. So, what did God do? Everyone who was over 20 died in the remaining 38 and a half years that they were wandering in the wilderness. And with as many people as they had, that means every day someone died. Now they could have gone into the promised land during the Feast of Trumpets of the second year, but they wouldn't listen. 
and they rebelled. So he quotes this so that we can get a lesson from it. Okay. Verse 16. For some after hearing did rebel, but not all who came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he indignant for 40 years? Was it not with those who had sinned and their dead bodies were strewn in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest? That is, enter into the promised land? Except to those who had disobeyed. So we see, here's the lesson. They were not able to enter in because of unbelief. Now think about that for a minute. Now the Sabbath is really, really important, and he covers it here in chapter 4. So let's learn the lesson of it here. You think anyone's going to get into the kingdom of God who is rebellious any more than those who did not go into the promised land because they were rebellious? Huh? No. No. Now, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, we should fear, lest perhaps a promise being open to enter into his rest, any of you might seem to come short. Okay. Now, that's also into the kingdom of God. And in the book of Isaiah, it is called his rest in Isaiah 11. For truly we have had the gospel preached to us, even as they did, but the preaching of the word did not profit them, because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard. Okay, what was the requirement? Keep my commandments, keep my Sabbaths, and remember what God did. Every Sabbath for 40 years, there was no manna you would think they would learn the lesson concerning that. But they didn't. See? Verse 3, For we who have believed, we ourselves are entering in to the rest. Now, this doesn't mean we're entering into the kingdom of God. This means we're entering into the rest of the Sabbath. Not the kingdom of God. That comes with the resurrection. As he had said, so I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. You see? It's conditional. Do you keep the Sabbath or do you not keep the Sabbath? Are you going to be in the kingdom of God or are you not going to be in the kingdom of God? Do you think you can get into the kingdom of God without keeping the Sabbath, which is a prophetic type every week, the seventh day? Okay, now let's read on because he makes it very important. Okay. Though the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spoke in a certain place, about the seventh day in this manner. Okay? The Sabbath, the seventh day. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, why did God do that? Well, the first Sabbath, he spent time with Adam and Eve, told them about who they are, what they are, what he's doing, and so forth. Huh? What do we learn on the Sabbath day when we keep it? We learn about God. We learn about what he's doing. We learn about his promises. We learn what faith is. We learn what love is. We learn what all of the things and characteristics we need to have. We learn on the Sabbath. So he's talking about the Sabbath day, the rest of it here. And the Protestants believe that Jesus kept the Sabbath for them. Now, if any one of you out there can keep the Sabbath for anyone else, 
You let me know because that will be quite a phenomena if that were possible. Okay? But God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again concerning this, that is the Sabbath, if they shall enter into my rest, because it's a choice. We choose to keep the Sabbath. It's a choice. And God, whenever there is if, it's on us. Never is an if on God. Okay. Consequently, since it remains for some to enter in, okay, now he's referring back to getting into the promised land, and those who had previously heard the gospel did not enter in because of disbelief. And did he have the Sabbath every week? All for the 40 years? Yes. And a lot of people didn't keep it. It says there in the book of Amos 5 that they worship Moloch in the wilderness. That's why God had to take the tent of the meeting with Moses and put it outside the camp. It's an amazing thing. Right in the presence of God, people rebel. Okay, so the Sabbath is laid out here if you're going to enter into my rest. Now, verse 7, again, he marks out a certain day, the seventh day, right? Today, saying in David after so long a time, Exactly as it has been quoted above, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And what is one of the greatest things that the Protestants harden their hearts over? The Sabbath day and the holy days, right? Yes. So it's, teaching a lesson going from the time of Joshua and entering the promised land and them not keeping the Sabbath and couldn't enter in compared with what we're to do, compared with what Christ wants us to do. All right? Let's go forward. Verse 8, referring back to the time of Israel in the wilderness and afterwards. For if Joshua had given them rest, now... Joshua took them into the promised land. But was that the complete fulfillment of God's plan, or was that one step, but a major step for the children of Israel? Yes. But he didn't give them the rest that's going to come with the millennium as shown in the New Testament. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken long afterwards, of another day. All right? This has to do the day of the Sabbath plus the day of the beginning of the millennium. All right? Notice, because of this, verse 9, there remains therefore Sabbath-keeping For the people of God. Who are the people of God in the New Testament? Are they just the children of Israel? Or are they Gentiles? They're Gentiles too. We find in Acts 13. We'll go there if we have time. Okay. Acts 13. Hold your place here and let's go there right now. All right. Acts 13. After there was a riot in the synagogue. You know, Paul, the Jews did not like to see Paul coming because when Paul came and he spoke, (laughs) he divided the synagogue. Now the Jews were angry. 
The Gentiles were happy. So Paul said in verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke boldly. So they went in there saying, It was necessary for the word of God to be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and do not judge yourselves worthy of eternal life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. See, again, if... Now, this means you keep the Sabbath the way God wants it. For so the Lord had enjoined upon us. I have set you for a light for the Gentiles that you should be for salvation unto the uttermost parts of the earth, as talking about Christ. And when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and glorified the word of the Lord and believed as many as were appointed to eternal life. And the word of the Lord was carried through the entire country. And the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and so forth, raised up a persecution, and they had to leave. Okay? Now, come back down here to verse 42. Actually, verse 41. Now, Paul didn't speak very kindly to them, did he? Here's to the Jews, verse 41. These are the scriptures we need to finish this off. Behold, you despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work that you will in no way believe, even if one declares it to you. And when the Jews had gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles entreated him that these words might be spoken to them. What? The next. Sabbath. What a perfect time to say, all you Gentiles out there, you know, these Jews over here, they are disobedient and non-believing, so we're going to meet tomorrow on Sunday because Sunday is the day that all you Gentiles are going to keep. And some of them would say, well, we already do that to the Son God. Huh? No. Sabbath. Okay. Now, now after they had, the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and proselytes who worshipped there followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. I want you to notice this next verse. Grace and Sabbath-keeping go to And on the coming Sabbath, almost the whole city was gathered together to hear the word of God. Okay? Now, let's come back to Hebrews 4 because this tells us how important the Sabbath is for us today. Remember when it says there in verse 9. Let's read it there. There remains, therefore, Sabbath-keeping and that is sabbatismos, and is noted throughout all of the Greek-speaking areas that that means the seventh-day Sabbath of God. Okay, Sabbath-keeping for the people of God, Hebrews 4 and verse 9. And the one who has entered into his rest, you enter into the Sabbath. Okay, right? He also has ceased from his works. You quit working. Just as God did from his own works. Now notice what else he says. We should be diligent, therefore, to enter into that rest of what? Sabbath keeping. Lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. Now, then he gives a very powerful verse here. See, does God mean business or not? Yes. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful. It's spiritual. And sharper than any two-edged sword. 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of both the soul and spirit and both the joints and marrow and is able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. And no other book is able to do that. And when do we find out about our sins? And when are they magnified in our eyes so that we quit sinning? When we come to God on the Sabbath and we study his word and we look at our lives. See? And we pray to God every day. And we yield our thoughts to him every day. We believe everything that God has said. See? And we don't try and change it. We don't try and add to it. We don't try and take away from it. We don't give excuse for it. If the things are there, there, we don't understand. We have to say we don't understand. Maybe God will give us understanding. Maybe he won't give us understanding. There are a lot of things we won't understand. In fact, majority of things we won't understand until we're spirit beings in the kingdom of God. All right? Now notice how important that Sabbath keeping is. Able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is not a created thing that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him of whom we must give account. See, and with God, there's no such thing as a secret that he doesn't know. What does he promise? Every secret shall be shouted from the housetops. Have we not seen that in politics? Don't we see it today? Pray tell, whatever little bit we're able to get from the news about the corrupt Biden family, not all those secrets being revealed. Whether they'll be punished for them or not because of the evil justice system, we don't know. Okay. So here's what we are to do. On the Sabbath day, and every day when we pray, therefore having a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, we should hold fast to the confession of our faith. We believe the Sabbath, hold fast to that. We believe the holy days, hold fast to that and keep them and study the word of God and put it together. And the marvelous thing will happen is God will give us more understanding, a bit here, a bit there, put it all together. And it's a tremendous thing, brethren, to understand the word of God the way that God wants us to understand it. And we see how God has so intelligently put it together that we must learn and obey certain basic things like the Sabbath and holy days before we can begin to understand some of these scriptures and why they are put the way that they are and how we are to learn from them. See? So this chapter 4 is quite a, quite a chapter, okay? Now, who has passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, hold fast to the confession of our faith, for we do not have a high priest who cannot empathize with our weaknesses. He knows we're weak. He understands the difficulties. He knows that sin can so easily entrap us. That's why he's given grace and mercy and forgiveness. Okay? Okay? but one who has been tempted in all things according to the likeness of our own temptations, yet he was without sin. Verse 16, Therefore we should come with boldness to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay? Well, in answering the questions we have so many, We'll go ahead and take another week of answering questions. And I have a couple of very difficult, difficult places in the New Testament 
that very few people really understand, and we will cover those next Sabbath. So, goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next week.